How does the sin flooding attack work? And how do sin cookies defend against it? How does the Great Firewall of China block the HTTP traffic containing keywords related to topics the Chinese government has banned discussion on? And how can you inject your own malicious commands into someone else's telnet session? Welcome to Frank's Diana Explains. I am Professor of Security and Privacy at the University of Cambridge, and this lecture is part of my security course for second year undergraduates at the Department of Computer Science and Technology. The other lectures in this course are in the playlist in the YouTube card above. Today's topic is TCP attacks, in particular the three attacks of SYN flooding, TCP reset and TCP session hijacking that are covered in chapter 16 of your textbook and in the TCP attacks seed lab. Note that this particular chapter is currently freely downloadable from the author's site, so be sure to check it out there if you haven't yet bought the textbook. To understand these attacks, some knowledge of the TCP protocol, and in particular of its three-way handshake, is assumed from your Part 1b computer networking course that you did earlier this year. To implement these attacks, the building blocks are packet sniffing and spoofing, which are introduced in Chapter 15 of the Computer and Internet Security textbook and covered in their own seed lab. This other preliminary seed lab is completely optional as far as I'm concerned, but it may be worth having a look at it for guidance on using the relevant tools, in particular the packet manipulation tool SCAPI and the packet analyzer Wireshark. If you can do the TCP attacks seed lab on its own, fine. But if you get stuck, then have a look at the packet sniffing and spoofing lab and book chapter for practical hints. The interesting thing about SCAPI is that it is not a closed tool, but a programmable toolkit in the form of a library that may be imported into and driven from your own Python scripts. Since Python is an interpreted language, elaborate packet processing with SCAPI will generally not be possible at line speed. To carry out some attacks on an actual network, it may be necessary to drop into C for performance reasons. But for understanding what happens and for a basic proof of concept demo, which is what we are after here, it is sufficient to stick with, to Python and SCAPI and to observe what's going on with Wireshark. Of course, SCAPI and Wireshark are themselves complex tools that cannot be mastered in just a few afternoons, and you're definitely not expected to know everything about them. As with so many other topics in this course, the meta skill for you to master here is to pick up enough know-how about these tools to be able to drive them in basic situations, such as the guided setting of the TCP attacks seed lab. The objective is not to become an expert, which nobody possibly could in a 12 lecture course, but to understand what's going on in the attacks to the point of being able to replicate them. If you later choose to become a specialist in network security, that will be when you dig deeper into all the details that we'll have to omit in this whistle-stop tour. As you know, with TCP you can in principle establish a reliable bidirectional connection from any machine on the internet to any other. The implementation of this reliable TCP connection happens on top of the unreliable IP layer, which sends individual packets from a source machine to a destination machine in a connectionless fashion. At the two endpoints, the source and the destination machine connect to the network using a network interface card, NIC or NIC which implements the physical link such as Ethernet or Wi-Fi. This physical link is often a shared medium, shared with other devices on the same local air network, and while in normal operations the receiving endpoint only cares about packets addressed to itself, its NIC actually also physically receives all the other packets traveling on the shared medium and addressed to other endpoints. These other packets that are not addressed to the endpoint in question are normally discarded by the NIC and are not passed on to the upper levels of the protocol stack but it is possible to ask the NIC to pass every received packet to the kernel by setting the NIC into promiscuous mode. This allows packet sniffing, which means listening to all the packets transmitting on the shared medium, even if they were not addressed to the listening machine. The regular sockets API will only let you receive packets addressed to your machine. If you want to do packet sniffing, you will need to use the so-called raw sockets. Usually, when you do packet sniffing, you have some specific purpose and you are only interested in certain packets, and it would be very inefficient for you to have to look in user space at all the other irrelevant packets that zoom by. For example, other users on your LAN segment might be streaming videos, imagine the fire hose of junk you might have to wade through. So the kernel offers a filtering facility whereby you state a criterion that defines which packets you're interested in, and the kernel then only gives you 
the packets that match this criterion. So you don't have to waste time on the others that you don't care about anyway and you would have thrown away anyway. You write this filter in a format known as the BSD packet filter or BPF which gets compiled into pseudocode and passed to the kernel driver as an object. SCAPI provides a convenient programmable API to the available raw packet manipulation facilities because most of the numerous details are taken care of by default. But conversely, you can do almost anything if you explicitly specify it. In the optional sniffing and spoofing seed lab, you are given a Docker network configuration with three machines at IP addresses 10901, called the seed attacker, 10905, host A, and 10906, host B. The very simple SCAPI based Python script shown here implements a packet sniffer. In line 7 you specify which network interface you wish to listen on, what filter you wish to apply, and you also define in lines 4 to 5, and supply in line 7 a callback that gets invoked on every packet that is passed back to your program. If you run this sniffer on the seed attacker machine and then ping host B from host A, it will show you the echo request packets going from A to B and the corresponding echo reply packets from B to A. With Wireshark, which is a fully featured pre-made packet sniffer, you similarly specify the filter, is ICMP, and the interface you wish to listen on, which will be this one that starts with BR and the exact uh, um, hex codes will be different on your computer. And then you get to see the packets in a GUI that lets you click on an item to get more details in an expansion pane below. It's more convenient for common tasks, but it's not programmable. So far we've just dealt with listening, also known as sniffing, from the network. But when you want to inject your own IP packets into the network, the regular Sockets API constrains you to doing only sensible and legitimate things. The source address, for example, is fixed at the IP address of your machine. The packet length is set to the actual length of the packet, and so forth. However, by using raw sockets, you may write anything you like into every header field, including garbage and intentional lies, and you can send out arbitrary packets into the shared medium, for example pretending that they were sent by some other machine, and this is called spoofing packets. You may easily spoof packets with SCAPI. In this listing, the seed attacker who runs the script from the 10901 machine sends what claims to be a ping packet from host B, which is the 10906 machine, to host A, 10905 machine. And Wireshark sees that as if it had really come from B. You see the source as 10906. Notice in line 6 of this listing, one of SCAPI's initially most disconcerting features, namely the fact that it overloads the division operator, the slash, to indicate stacking of objects at different protocol layers. So that line packet equals IP divided by ICMP, it's not divided, okay? You should read it as the packet object uh, is constructed from the previously built IP object on top of which we stack the previously built ICMP object. So you may stack several layers on top of each other in this way, separating them by forward slashes. Now let's come to SYN flooding. As you know, in the TCP three-way handshake, when Alice wants to establish a TCP connection with Bob, she sends him a SYN packet. With an arbitrarily chosen sequence number X, Bob is supposed to respond with a SYN ACK packet with a new unrelated sequence number chosen by Bob, Y. While the acknowledgement number increments Alice's sequence number to X plus 1. Alice then responds with an ACK packet in which the sequence number is the x plus 1 she received from Bob, whereas the acknowledgement number is Bob's sequence number incremented by 1. Now when Bob receives an ACK with an implausible sequence or acknowledgement number, he rejects the packet. To decide which incoming ACK packets are legitimate, Bob, the party who did not initiate the connection, must be able to tell if the sequence and acknowledgement numbers in the incoming ACK are compatible with those he sent out in his own SYN plus ACK. And towards that he keeps track of the half-open TCP connection in a suitable data structure which is created here and it's called a transmission control block. So one of these gets allocated. Because several such connections could be established in parallel, Bob maintains a list of TCBs. And if no ACK comes back, 
After a while, Bob resends the CNAC, and after a few failed attempts at that, Bob gives up and removes the TCB from the list. This may take tens of seconds. Uh, long live in network terms. Since each of these half-open connections has to be looked after in this way, the list of TCBs has a bounded size, and once it is full, then Bob will no longer be able to accept any new connections until some existing slot is freed up. Notice that a TCB may also be removed from the list if a reset packet for the half-open connection is received, and we'll talk more about reset packets in a moment. The SYN flooding attack consists precisely of exhausting all the available slots in Bob's list so as to impede the establishment of new incoming TCP connections. It is a, basically a denial of service attack on Bob. The attacker, Karen, sends a multitude of SYN packets to victim Bob, but without ever responding to Bob's SYNAC. So to every one of these, Bob responds with a SYNAC, 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 and allocates a TCB, allocates a TCB, allocates a TCB, uh, but no, no ACK ever comes back from Karen. Now, if Karen sends these SYN packets at a sufficiently high rate, then Bob's list of TCBs will fill up. To avoid being traced, then Karen will spoof her SYN packets and use a fake source address, a different one in each one. This means that Bob's SYN ACK packets will go somewhere else, but she doesn't mind because uh, Karen was not going to answer them anyway. She uses a different random address for her SYN message, otherwise Bob, on noticing the attack, could easily block all her messages with a simple firewall rule. In the relevant task of your seed lab, you recreate the SYN flooding attack against a target machine and you observe the effect of various countermeasures. Are there any difficulties in coming up with the correct numbers in the spoofed packets sent by Karen? Actually, no. The source address is picked at random, as we said. The destination address is obviously that of the victim, Bob, and the initial sequence number of a SYN message uh, is chosen by the sender anyway. So there's nothing that Karen ought to guess for her messages to look legitimate. So from that viewpoint, the attack is trivial. Absent specific countermeasures, the only problem for Karen is that if she's using SCAPI rather than a compiled C program, she might not be able to send out her attack packets quickly enough to overwhelm Bob. The main countermeasure against this attack is the SYN cookie. It's a clever construction that allows Bob to verify the sequence and acknowledgement numbers of incoming acts without having to retain any state. How does it work? Bob no longer allocates a TCB on reception of a SYN packet. And this immediately defeats the SYN flooding attack because the resource that Karen was attempting to exhaust, which is the finite sized list of TCBs at Bob's end, no longer exists at all. But if Bob no longer retains state, how can he verify incoming acts? If he were now incapable of distinguishing genuine acts from fake acts, then Karen could now simply flood him with acts instead of with sins, because accepting an act must also result in the allocation of a TCB. The sin cookie construction allows Bob to verify acts without retaining state, because all the information needed for verification is embedded in the act number that the initiating party must provide in the third message. What's clever about this construction is that it retains full compatibility with the existing protocol. The SYN cookie is nothing other than a particular choice of Bob's Y sequence number in his SYNAC message. The sequence number uh, that Bob provides is computed as a MAC of the source address, port number, and sequence number in the SYN packet using a secret MAC key known only to Bob, so nobody else other than Bob could compute this Y. Since the other party must return the Y sequence number incremented by 1 in the ACK packet, Bob can redo the computation when he receives it and check if the computed value matches the supplied one. On the other hand, a malicious party, Karen, cannot spoof a valid ACK without knowledge of the Y that Bob sent out because the computation of Y involves a secret that was only known to Bob. If we go into the details, Bob's behavior is as follows. Whenever Bob receives a SYN packet with source address S1 and port number P1 and sequence number X1, then he computes a SYN cookie, which is going to be Y2 equal to a MAC 
with the key known only to Bob uh, of k of these parameters s1, p1, and uh, x1. So he sends back to, to Alice this y2 over here, and he sends an acknowledgement number a2, uh, call it a2, equals x1 plus 1. And then he simply forget about this exchange. Okay, Karen may send as many scene messages uh, as she wants over here, and Bob will perform the above operations for each of them in a stateless fashion. So it may cost him a bit of computation, but uh, he doesn't have to retain any state, doesn't have to memorize uh, the stuff that he was doing before in uh, you know, allocating a TCB. Conversely, when, whenever Bob receives the third message, the ACK, then uh, he must decide whether to accept or not this uh, ACK, and if he accepts it, he must allocate the TCB. So he must be careful about not accepting fake ones. Assume that the received ACK has a source address S3 and a port number P3 and a sequence number X3 that was supposed to match A2. And then an acknowledgement number A3 uh, which is supposed to match uh, y2 plus 1, y2 plus 1. Okay, so Bob computes y prime 2 as the Mac with his secret key k of the received stuff, s3, p3, and x3. And then uh, he considers the incoming ACK packet as valid if and only if y prime 2 plus 1 is equal to this a3. If yes, then he accepts the packet and allocates the TCB, otherwise he throws the packet on the floor. And Karen cannot build ACK packets that will pass this check uh, because she does not have Bob's k over here um, to compute the MAC over uh, the values that she may put in her packet. The seed lab you will be doing today also discusses an additional countermeasure that is present in recent Linux kernels, whereby known good addresses that had previously established valid connections with Bob are cached, so that filling up the available slots when, when, when you have this uh, list of TCBs, then some of these slots are reserved for uh, computers that previously established connections with Bob and filling up the other uh, items in the list does not affect them because they still re retain the ability to connect, reconnect to Bob. They, they have a kind of booked room in this hotel. Thus the denial of service attack only affects new hosts that had not previously connected to Bob and are not in, in this cache. And this mitigation is automatically enabled whenever SYN cookies are disabled. Now let's move on to a second attack which is the TCP reset. There are at least two ways of closing down a TCP connection. A consensual one, which involves two pairs of FinAC messages. So you fin, I mean, I want to finish, and ack, ack, okay, I understand. And then I also want to finish, uh, and okay, I understand. So fin, ack. And then besides this, there is another way of closing down a TCP connection, which is a, a unilateral way, which is used primarily in the context of errors, where one party just sends a reset message reset, to reset the connection and then drops out without even waiting for a response. And an example where you would use the second style would be, for example, uh, when there is a SYN flood attack on Bob, uh, then a third party host who... So when, does this, when there is a SYN flood attack on Bob, like this, then Bob sends lots of SYNACs to places that are not actually the original recipient. They are other things on the internet corresponding to the fake source address that was put in by the attacker. So when one of these guys receives a SYNAC, say, well, what the hell am I getting a SYNAC for? I didn't even send uh, a SYN to that, uh, to that party. And so let's reset this connection. So this Dave here will send a reset to Bob, uh, who will then know uh, not to continue with that. This lets Bob close the half-open connection and throw away the TCB without waiting for it to time out, uh, that, assuming that Bob wasn't already using SYN cookies and therefore not allocating TCBs at that stage. The TCP reset attack 
is another form of denial of service in which the attacker can tears down an, est an existing established connection between victims Alice and Bob. So you have Alice and Bob have already done their three-way handshake and they're merely exchanging messages in this uh, bi-directional connection, bi-directional TCP connection that's been established. And to disrupt that, Karen will send, uh, will spoof a reset packet, pretending it was sent from one of the two correspondents to the other. And for this spoof packet to be accepted, if it's, she pretends to send it from Alice to Bob, then for Bob to accept the reset packet and, and drop the connection, then Karen must fill in the correct headers, the source and destination addresses uh, and ports must be correct, and also the sequence and acknowledgement numbers. If the attacker shares the same physical medium as uh, at least one of the victims, then she can sniff the network to read the headers of the packets in the ongoing connection, and then compute the correct header fields for a next packet in the same connection. So task two of your seed lab lets you do that for a telnet connection. And telnet is a relatively easy target because there are long gaps between the bursts of packets because the packets uh, encode the keys that are being pressed by a human being. Your textbook also discusses applying this uh, TCP reset attack to SSH connections, which are encrypted, and to video connections, which are high bit rate. But neither of these are required from you in this seed lab. A TCP reset attack on SSH works similarly to that on Telnet because SSH encryption happens at the transport layer and does not protect the headers of the IP packets. So you see the same things as you see uh, as in the unencrypted Telnet session. The attack on video streams is somewhat more challenging than the one on Telnet because the transmission rate is too high to be able to mount the attack manually. You have to write a program that sniffs the packet from the connection that the attacker wants to disrupt and immediately spoofs a reset packet for it. And, and even so, there is a race condition and a scappy based attack, even if it's uh, pre programmed rather than manual, may be too slow to succeed. TCP reset attacks are used in the real world for internet censorship, whether by authoritative regimes that wish to block access to certain sites or by media corporations that are fighting peer to peer file exchange. The main countermeasure against this kind of censorship is to connect through a VPN at which point the attacker can no longer observe the individual TCP connections of the intended target host because they are hidden inside the encrypted VPN pipe. Let's now move on to our third attack, which is TCP session hijacking. Contrary to the previous two attacks, this one is not merely about denial of service. Here, the attacker Karen, in presence of an established TCP connection between Alice and Bob, kicks out Alice and takes over the connection impersonating Alice to Bob. In task three of your seed lab, Bob is a file server, and Alice is a user who's running a telnet session to that server. Karen's objective is to inject one specific malicious command to delete a certain file, for example, into the telnet session. And the modus operandi of the attacker is similar to that of the TCP reset attack against telnet. You sniff the network, you extract the fields from the latest packet, you compute valid fields for the malicious packet, which this time contains not a reset, but the intended command for server Bob, and then you inject the spoof packet into the network before the victim Alice sends her next packet. The optional task four in your seed lab is somewhat more sophisticated and powerful. It sets up a reverse shell that allows Karen to type commands interactively at Bob's console, effectively taking over the session as if she were Alice. Conceptually, the attack still consists of just executing one command on the server, so the novelty here is in the payload rather than in the attack vector, which is essentially identical to that of task 3. This new payload requires some understanding of little-known and powerful redirection features of the bash shell. It's provided as little more than a script kiddie recipe in the seed lab, but it is discussed in a bit more detail in the textbook. Have a look if you're interested, and it's very cool once you get it to work. It's pretty amazing if you've never done this before. But as I said, this is optional stuff. Now in this video and other recent videos, we have delved into pretty geeky technical stuff, cross-site request forgery, cross-site scripting, and now TCP attacks. But the security professional cannot lose sight of the big picture. The system we are protecting includes users. In fact, users are often the most precious component of the system. And for our protection to be effective, we need to understand and anticipate how users will react, which tends to be rather different from how the geeks who design highly technical systems would react. So don't miss this video 
where I will introduce you to one of the most colorful co-authors I've had the pleasure to work with, Paul Wilson, who's an amazing pickpocket, sleight of hand artist, and also a magician and a TV presenter. Say pickpocket in your comment to signal you got this far. Have fun hijacking Telnet sessions in your TCP attacks seed lab. Thank you very much for watching, and you will see me again in this next video.